that you have given us in our life and we would ask that you continue to bless us. We would ask that you be with all those who are mentioned here this morning and others that 
that only you know about and give them the strength and the healing and the comfort that they, they need. I want you over to guide us in all things that we do and say and be with Mark as he brings the message this morning that he will bring us closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our last song before Mark comes to deliver the message is Tell Me the Old, Old Story, 621. We'll do verses 1 and 3 of this one. So 621, Tell Me the Old, Old Story, verses 1 and 3. Oh, 
scream Jesus. Jesus! If you're happy and you know it, scream Jesus. Jesus! If you're happy and you know it, if your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, scream Jesus. Jesus! Do all three. If you're happy and you know it, do all three. Wee! for inspiration, but it's a reminder, Psalm 23 is, that life is a walk with God. You and Jesus are like sheep and a shepherd. Uh, and along that path of a sheep and shepherd, there's all kind of blessings, <laughs> restores our soul, the beautiful pastures, and there are also troubles in life, the difficulties, uh, the valley of the shadow of death, uh, even as the passage talks to us about. And so we're here talking about the life of Joseph. And in some ways I want you to understand as we read these Bible stories that God gives us these stories to remind us that what happened a long time ago to these people that are listed in your Bible are very similar, even though the times have changed, even to you today. Joseph is like you in some ways, to different extremes maybe. But still, it's apparent, and we have an opportunity to learn or be inspired by the simple truth out of Joseph's life that God is there with him. God is with him even when? God is with him even when he finds himself in the most difficult of situations, that God is with Joseph, and God is with you. And when God is with us, God is good. And beyond that, the reminder in Joseph's life that God's promises are always faithful. Where did we leave Joseph? If you have your Bibles, we're going to start in chapter 42 uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, tell the story and then kind of end up there in chapter 45. There's several, uh, so, so, several chapters that deal with uh, this part of the story. Uh, but Joseph, the one who was sold by his brothers, uh, was it falsely accused, was imprisoned, uh, and, and stayed there. And finally we get to a point last week where Joseph had elevated himself up to power. He had worked his way up to the second in command there in Egypt. I want you to pause for a moment and say, no, that's not what happened. 
Joseph didn't work his way out of anywhere. Uh, Joseph uh, didn't believe in himself. Uh, Joseph didn't keep positive. Uh, Joseph didn't ignore the bad. Joseph didn't surround himself with things that are comfortable. Joseph trusted God, and it was God who moved him where he needed to be. It was God who was with him, who took him from prison and put him in second command in the land of Egypt, the most powerful nation at that time, to help save people from this famine. And it's a simple reminder that no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, in your trials, in your blessings, it's not you who puts yourself there. It's God who put you there. Even in the tough times, even in the good times, the reminder here of Joseph that it was God who walked with him and put him in those positions as it will come forth today in the text. And Jacob, uh, Joseph's job was just to have faith and trust the Lord. If you have your Bibles, let's read the first, nine, or first 12 verses of chapter 42 here in the book of Genesis uh, as we get into the story today. Genesis chapter 42, uh, verses 1 through 9 says this. When Jacob... Learned that there was grain in Egypt. Jacob is Joseph's father, who's back in the land of Canaan, just to set up the story. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at one another? I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we will live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's youngest brother, with the others, because he was afraid of the harm that might come to him. So Israel's sons, Jacob's sons, were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan as well. Now Joseph was governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all the people. Uh, so when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him as the, with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but they pretended he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he said? From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, Joseph said to them, You have come to see where our land is unprotected. So, the story of Joseph is interesting, uh, to say the least, from where he's been to where he finds himself. Number two in the land, able to make any decree or declaration and have it done. And it's at that moment, in that position, that God sends his brothers, the ones who betrayed him, uh, the ones who mocked him and made fun of him all of his life as a kid, down to Egypt to buy grain that was only available from his hand. And as they come down to Egypt, the Bible tells us that they, they uh, come into this place to buy grain and they put themselves down on the ground uh, before this person who had all of this power. You remember the dreams that Joseph had. Uh, and when he was born as a kid, he said, yes, God is going to take care of me and, and God is going to provide me and to a point where all ten of you will bow down. He had the dream of the stars. He had the dream of the bushels of grain bowing down to the one, the twelve, uh, to the one uh, in that way. They did not recognize Joseph. It's interesting because Joseph was now dressed as an Egyptian, because Joseph was really rich, because Joseph, they had no idea where he went. They just sold him to a group of traveling people uh, to go and be a slave. He, he could have ended up anywhere. It was not in their any furthest imagination that the person that they would be buying grain from would be their long lost brother. But Joseph recognized them, and it gave him all kind of opportunity, all kind of upper hand. I'm not sure if you remember where the story goes, uh, but Joseph begins by saying, ha ha, you're spies. Uh, you know, and maybe it's that moment of not knowing that they were going to be there and having the chance to see them at the first time and not knowing how to react. Maybe the, all, this is where all of the emotion comes forth. And again, we put ourselves in this situation. You've been there, right? When, when you have the opportunity to see somebody that you haven't seen for a long time on purpose, <laughs> uh, that you don't want to run into, uh, that you never expect to see, and all of a sudden they're there, uh, that palms are sweaty, and oh, what are we going to do? And so what Joseph does is he begins to accuse him right away. 
your spies coming to take out the land. And they're like, no, 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 we're, we're honest. We're not spies. There's no way. He says, well, in order to prove that you're spies, I'm going to keep one of you here. And, and they, he began to ask them questions about their family and found out that there was a younger brother at home. Did you catch that part of the story? That Jacob didn't let his youngest son go with the ten brothers. Benjamin was not allowed to go because of what happened to his other son when he went out to check on those very same brothers. He was not about to trust them, uh, trust the rest of the boys with his youngest. He was precious to them. He was protecting them in some way. And so Joseph had learned, had got that much information about his brothers from them in their situation. He said, here's the deal. I'm going to treat you like spies until you go and bring that your youngest brother back to me. One of you are going to have to stay here. So the Bible tells us that it was Simeon who was uh, put there uh, to stay. Uh, and then it tells them that as they then bought their grain to take it back home to their dad, uh, that Joseph said to his servants, he said, put the, uh, put the money that they gave you for the grain back into their bags so that they don't know it. And in the way the Bible tells the story, as, as they were making their way back to their homeland, they opened up their bag, and the money that they had given to pay for the grain was there on top of the grain that they had taken home. Well, they had already had problems with this fella uh, about getting grain, and they knew that this only would cause more problems within them. In fact, it wasn't just in one bag, but as they got home and opened them up, it was in, on top of every one of their bags. We don't know why Joseph wanted to do this. Was he testing them? Was he putting them to find out what they would do and how honest they could be? We don't know. But we do know that it caused such a problem with the boys that when that grain ran out, when that food ran out, they waited all this time leaving their other brother Simeon down there in Egypt. Dad finally said, uh, we're going to go get more grain. Boys, go pack up and go get more. And they're like, no, 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 no. We can't do that. He told us that we can't get anything else until we bring our youngest brother with us. And Jacob said, well, that's not going to happen. And so they waited. And he got hungry and hungrier. And finally, Jacob gave in and said, okay, I will send Benjamin with the rest of you to go get this grain from the people there in Egypt. And it must have crushed him to make that decision. In fact, there was a little bit of uh, discussion between uh, the commitment that they were going to make to make sure that this, uh, that this youngest son was going to make it back to them. Uh, and so they brought Benjamin back to Joseph's place where they could come in and see, or where he could see that they did yet have uh, a younger brother and he was still alive and still protected. So the scene unfolds when they come back into the place to get the food. Joseph sees them. And he sees their younger brother with them. And so he says, okay, invite all of these men in. We're going to have a dinner. The guys, the rest of the brothers, didn't really know what was going on at the time. And so they have this feast here in the land of Egypt with this foreigner who they think is out to get them, has accused them of spies. There is a lot of trepidation going on. Not sure what is going to happen in this story. The Bible tells us then that as they are there, uh, Joseph has a chance uh, to meet Benjamin, his youngest brother, uh, and th that things go off really well, although Joseph do still does not identify who he is. He sees that they're honest, and he sends them back to their father with their grain. But this time, instead of putting money into the, every one of their sacks of grain that they took back with them, he said, servants, go to Benjamin's sack, the youngest, and put my golden tableware in his sack. And so as soon as the boys left and took back off to the land of Canaan from Egypt, Joseph sent his police force out after them. Oh, we got a problem. Someone stole something. And of course, the brothers are like, oh, it wasn't us. We would never push the issue. It don't know. It's not us at all. And he said, well, let's see. And they started at the oldest and opened up the sack, and there was nothing there. They worked to another one to open up the sack. It's just like every good story. It worked itself down to where they got to the youngest Benjamin's sack and opened it up. And sure enough, there was the tableware of Joseph in the sack. And of course, the boys just melted. Oh no, what are we going to do? Now you're going to keep this? My dad is going to kill me. I mean, this is literally where that phrase comes from uh, in Scripture. If we don't bring our little brother back, my dad is going to 
have a meltdown. This is not going to be good. And so they begin to throw themselves at Joseph, uh, letting him, or trying to get him to make a, a transaction to say, take me instead of Benjamin. Whatever you do, well, let's make this transition. It's at that moment that we get to Genesis chapter uh, 45. Oh, I did miss one passage I wanted to read. If you have your Bible still there, in Genesis chapter uh, 40, uh, 42, uh, right in all of this, con the difficulty that the boys, the brothers are having, it says there with uh, verse 20 and following, uh, they're talking to one another, the brothers are, but you must bring the youngest brother back to me, Joseph says to them, so that your words will be verified that you will not die. They proceeded to do. Then they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother, referencing Joseph. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why this, this distress has come upon us. Reuben said, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we have to give an accounting of his blood. So it wasn't out of their brother's minds that this action, this interaction they had with the guy from Egypt was a direct result of what they had already done with uh, their brother Joseph. So we get to the point, finally, where they bring their brother back. Uh, Genesis chapter 45, uh, the first few verses there, as that chapter begins, uh, it says this. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. Before all of the attendants, he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that all the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said this to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me there, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there's been a famine in the land, and for the next five years will not be, there will not be plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph tells his brothers in that way. What a great story. As it comes down to the point where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, his brothers are terrified. Oh dear, this is the guy that we sold into slavery. And now he has this power over us. And now he has all of this uh, situation uh, with, with the grain and accusations that can be levied against him. They were fearful for their lives. And Joseph said, relax. You think you did this to me. But it really wasn't you. It was God. God put me here for a purpose. And with those words, we get this beautiful picture of forgiveness in the story of Joseph and his brothers. Forgiveness. That's one of the words that Christians are all about, right? Oh, we love to be forgiven. But here is a story where a person who's been wronged has the opportunity, has the blessing to forgive others. I mean, there's a lot that we can learn from the story of Joseph uh, about living patiently, about living with faith. But the biggest thing I want to draw your attention to is this understanding of what the importance of the, as a believer in Jesus, we have to be forgivers. We've started the last few weeks with the tough questions, right? You remember? Have you ever been betrayed? <laughs> have you ever been uh, isolated? Uh, have you ever had to be patient? And it leads to this point where we see Joseph showing us the depth of forgiveness. Where we see him showing us the blessing of forgiveness. Where we see truly even the key to forgiveness. So the question I want to begin with today is this. What do you need to learn about forgiving other people? Forgiveness is not just an issue between you and them. Because God is there in the middle. That's what I think we can hear from this story. That God is there in the trial. That God is there in the freedom of forgiveness. That God knows what event has happened to you in your past. And his message is still that I will be there with you. Why is forgiving seem to be one of the most difficult things in the world to do? You know, it's hard to forgive somebody else. 
Because usually when somebody does something bad to you, what you want is justice. <laughs> no, what you want is revenge. If someone has hurt you, you want to cause that hurt back upon them. If someone has inconvenienced you, you want to heap more inconvenience back to them. If someone treats you badly, you want to return the favor and treat them just as badly, if not more. But God says, church, no. God says, my way is not that way. My way is to forgive. So where did Joseph get his strength to forgive his brothers? I think you can see that Joseph understood the bigger picture. That was his secret. He understood that God was watching over everything and that God was using their evil for something good. The passage that we read there. Uh, it wasn't you who sold me here. Uh, God sent me here before you. It, it was God's fault that all of this happened because God has his hand in every part of my life. And that is the truth that gave Joseph the strength to forgive his brothers. I think the reality is that's what God wants for you and me to do. Also, to forgive that person who hurts you. Forgive that person who hurts your family behind your back. Forgive that person who takes advantage of you. Forgive everyone who has ever done anything wrong to you. Forgive them all is the call of Jesus upon your heart today. And it's true. Some of the hardest things in the world to do is offer forgiveness to people that you don't think deserve it. God will give you the strength we find from the story of Joseph. And he will help you focus on the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture in the whole story of forgiveness is the reminder that God has already forgiven you. We have a beautiful story where Jesus talks about the unmerciful servant, uh, the fellow who goes to his boss and says, I can't repay the bill. And his boss says, no problem. I will forgive your debt. And then he turns right around and goes someone who, to someone who owes him a lot lesser money, and he has that person thrown in prison because they're not able to pay it. Sometimes that's the way that Christians live. We want to receive forgiveness from God. That's why we show up to church. That's why we have communion time. We want to feel like God's forgiveness is upon us. But the story of Joseph is a reminder that you are charged to give forgiveness to other people as well. Not just to people that want to do it, but to everybody. The biggest picture is since God has forgiven me, even though I don't deserve it, I will forgive others even when they don't deserve it. I will trust that God will take the bad things that people do to me and will work it for something good. God did that to Joseph, and I know that God will do that for you as well. We need to have that resolve that we're not going to take revenge. That we're not going to retaliate. That the best thing a Christian can do is forgive. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute. You mean that I need to forgive if I'm a victim? Wait about abuse, preacher. I've been abused. I've been humiliated, preacher. I've been enslaved. What if someone close to you has been murdered? The abandoned baby? The Holocaust victim? The disfortunate orphan? The sex slave? The unjustly fired worker? No matter the situation that you're in, God's story is still about forgiveness. No matter how bad you've had it, and I trust that some of you have had it bad. I'm not trying to undersell that. The story of Joseph, he had it bad. His story was horrible, what his family did to him. And he still had an opportunity to turn around and forgive them. A lot of Christians have that opinion. Well, wait a minute, preacher. I've been baptized. I show up most Sundays. Uh, isn't that really what matters? Uh, why so much the emphasis on forgiveness? Do I really have to forgive people of everything that they do to me? What if they're not sorry? Do I have to forgive them even then? Those questions are best asked to Jesus. Because that's how he forgave us. We need to be people of forgiveness. And here's a truth that I struggle with today. Forgiveness is important to the believer. It's essential to the believer. Because don't fool yourself. If you think you're taking an unforgiving heart into heaven, who do you think you are? How dare you come to that conclusion? 
That you think that God's going to open heaven's gates to someone who you can't forgive, that you can't forgive other people when he has lavished his forgiveness upon us? <laughs> this is a harsh subject, I know. Because I know there's pain in life. I know there's hurt in life. And I know it gets dirty. I know it gets hurtful. I know it gets difficult. But even in those situations, in this example of Joseph, we have the opportunity to forgive. It's Jesus' words when he's there on the Sermon on the Mount. that he says, hey, if you're getting ready to go to church and you have a problem with your brother and you're getting ready to give money to the church and make an offering to God, the best thing that you need to do is leave your offering there wherever you are and go fix your relationship with your brother and then come back and offer your gift before God. We got way too many people trying to drag that baggage along with them in worship. You want to know how you why you have such a hard time in worshiping God for the forgiveness that He gives to you? Maybe because you're not good at forgiving other people. Maybe there's a lot of bitterness still there. Maybe there's a lot of anger deep down. Forgiveness is such an important part of a Christian because it shows where our faith is. It's not in ourself. It's not in our right. It's not in our pride. It's just like Joseph said. It's given it up to God. God knows the situation that you've been in and he's put you in that situation so that you can forgive and give blessing to him. It's the Lord's Prayer. If you forgive men their sins... Your heavenly Father will forgive you your sins. But if you don't forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father won't forgive your sins. Church, I just want to remind you that forgiveness is a big deal to the Lord. It's important that we learn how to, that we make ourselves, that we find opportunity to forgive. And don't forgive foolishly. Though the forgiveness may feel foolish, It'll be well with your soul. It was Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes that needs to be our opinion. We don't have to make them understand why we're forgiving them. We don't have to make that party who hurt us so badly understand what pain they've caused us. Sometimes the best thing we need to do is just learn to say, God, they don't have a clue. But please help my heart be right with you and be right with them. Don't let the guilt or bitterness seep inside your heart. I'm not saying that you have to put up with everything. Get out of the relationship. Break it off. Stop the pain. Break the chain. But while you do that, have a forgiving heart towards the other person. Joseph is the example. Jesus is the example. The key is don't put yourself in position between God and God's plan as we figure out more and more that life is all about God. And life is about what God has done for us. It helps us learn how to forgive other people. It helps us to let go of that bitterness. Because it's not ours to hold in the first place. And I get it. It's been bad. It's been devastating for some people. And by the world's standards, you have a right. But God's standards are different. And the reminder that we have with this story is that God will be with you to strengthen you because he did it first. This past year, we've had a few conversations. I've had a few conversations with some of the boys who've been back from the children's home back when I was a kid there, 37 years ago. And a guy who would call me every now and again, and most of the time he was drunk because he couldn't handle his situation. And he was angry. I don't know why my dad sent me to the children's home. He didn't need to do that. This was 35 years ago. And he would still call me and complain about what his dad did to them. Bitterness. It was harsh. He couldn't let go of it. He didn't understand how. He didn't understand the reason to let go of it. He was owed something. <clears throat> Took him to his grave. I had another boy just a few weeks ago reach out. A guy who I grew up with. Spent a lot of years with him because he had nothing. Uh, his mom was in a nursing home, which is why he was at the children's home in the first place. He had no home to go back to. And so uh, mom and dad took him in, and he stayed with us all the way through until he graduated high school and went off to college and hadn't talked to him for, hadn't heard from him in 35 years. A couple weeks ago, he sent me a text and said, hey, is this you? He said, I'm really looking for a picture of your dad. 
I've got a few pictures on my wall, and I really just want a picture of your dad to remember <coughs> how much he cared for me. I'm like, I had every opportunity to be mad at the Lord. Every opportunity to hold on to the bitterness and the anger that is there. That's the difference, Christian, and what it means to forgive. And I know that it's not a story that you haven't heard. Because I know that your heart's hurt. Life is horrible. But God is better. Life is harsh. But God's way is better. And God's way is for forgiveness. The beautiful thing is, God offers you forgiveness. And it's even more beautiful, more beautiful, directly in your life as you have that chance to offer God's forgiveness to other people uh, as well. I know that you're there. I know that you're troubled. I know that you, throughout this, there's your faith of hoping and praying and struggling. But what I want to do is offer, how can we help you learn how to forgive? It's that important. It's that something that we have to get control of in our life. We have to keep the perspective that God is the one who's in control. That we need to add more God to our life. Not add more pride, not add more self-righteousness, but a submission to our Heavenly Father. The verse that we read just a few weeks ago, uh, coming out of the story of, of Joseph's life, uh, brought us back to uh, uh, the understanding uh, of uh, how we interact uh, with the Lord. And it was the simple verse, verse from James that said, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I know some of you feel like there's no way. Preacher, you just don't know. And I don't know. But I want to help you because it's important to you. As we come to the conclusion of our service today, I just want to offer that to you. I know that there's people out there with so much baggage that they've been carrying around that they need to learn how to let go of. And I got time. I'd love to be able to help you talk you through it. Forgiveness is a big deal. And not just being ignorant of, well, somebody happened to me and I'm not going to pay attention to it. Because the bitterness is still there. It's learning to turn that over to the Lord. Learning to trust in the Lord. Learning to give it back to the Lord. We've all been in those unfortunate situations. But God's promise is still the same promise that He gave to us way back in Psalm 23. I'll be there with you. I will lead you like a good shepherd takes care of his sheep. How can we help you with forgiveness today? The beautiful part is the opportunity to find forgiveness is just a, a matter of, of a moment away. It's turning to the Lord Jesus and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've messed up. I need help. And it's the same with finding strength to forgive other people. It's just that point of saying, Lord, I need help. I've been trying to do it my way for 40 years, and I can't do it. Uh, send somebody to help me with those decisions. And that's what we're here for as a church body. To encourage one another, to pray for you one another, to help you all take those steps of faith in your life. I don't know where you are today. And what decisions that you need to make uh, to follow the Lord. Maybe it's a decision to be baptized. Maybe it's some sin in your life that has been dragging you down. Uh, maybe it's the sin that somebody else has caused uh, upon you that you're just having a hard time get letting go of. Let us share with you. Let us encourage you uh, as we move along. Uh, we come to our hymn uh, of decision uh, today. It's uh, everything's backwards this morning. Number 488, Just As I Am. Uh, if you need uh, to uh, make a decision for the Lord today, come forward. We're going to stand and sing the first verse. 488, Just As I Am. Uh, let us help you.
Lord, help us to submit every part of our life to you, not just the good parts, not just the happy parts, but Lord, even the deep parts of the things that we struggle with. We thank you so much for your promises. We thank you so much for your presence. Lord, may we be good witnesses of your love to other people. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll continue on with our music this morning, number 605, Living for Jesus. Let's sing the first and the fourth verse. <coughs>
loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievance you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let's pray. <laughs> So call either Sharon uh, or Nancy to make sure that we have that covered. And, and I know twenty dollars is steep, is cheap, uh, is steep. C B T is the only thing I can think of. Cheap. What am I doing? The church wants to pay half of that, so it'll be a ten dollar meal for uh, you all if you want to go to that, just to make it more available for people uh, to go to be a part of that. So. I wanted to let you know with those things. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Cheap, cheap, or jeeps. Let's stand and have a closing prayer. Father God, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you, Lord, for your commitment to us, for your depth of your love, and the amazingness uh, of your faithfulness. Lord, help us. Uh, we know sometimes we struggle. Uh, we know the obstacles that uh, sometimes seem unsurmountable. But Lord, we thank you for your presence and your spirit being with us. Help us, Lord, keep our eyes focused on you and the great promises that you've given to us of heaven and eternity. Thank you, Lord, for these people. Be a blessing on them today. Uh, watch over us in our community. Uh, Lord, help us to be uh, a great witness of your love to other people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.